Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about from infrastructure as code to cloud native deployments in five minutes. Um, I'm Michael. I'm a developer evangelist at GitLab and you can find me online as DNS Michi, which is DNS M-I-C-H-I on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitLab and everywhere else. Um, I want to start my story with telling you a little bit about a developer's tale, how it started out like 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, um, when we wanted to push the code to production. So maybe I was creating my first web app or my backend app. Then I was creating a tarball, sending the tarball or the zip archive to the server admin, but attaching it to an email. Then the question was how to install it. Yeah, maybe just untar or unzip it. Um, and then um, the returned question was, could you maybe write some documentation so we don't need to repeat um, the Q&A for the next releases? Um, the next thing was to say, well, production is a little different to the dev environment. So maybe make install is failing just because some modules are not installed and the module is, is not actually there and the installation is aborting. So the server admin approaches the developer again and asks for maybe adding dependency management. Um, then an idea adding autoconf and configure for detecting that and as a developer i really need to learn a new language next to the one i'm currently using for developing the application um, then and that another step is diving a little into packaging um, just because well configure worked out quite well but customers request uh, to provide rpm packages so Let's have a, have a look at the spec files. Looks rather easy. In the end, macro conditions are really hard, um, especially if you need to support specific distributions and if then else, well, it's it's a learning curve. Um, another customer approaches um, your project um, and wants to have Debian packages or Ubuntu packages. Um, well, and then you need to learn a new tool chain world and manage dependencies and understand everything in addition to also knowing how RPM packaging works. Because you want you have customers, for example, on Red Hat, on, on SUSE, on wherever other architecture which is supporting RPM packaging. So as a developer, we probably want to sort of automate this or maintain this. And one of the ideas was we want to have a build server which creates the packages automatically for us. Whenever we push something into the Git repository, an RPM package, a Debian package is created and upon release, we also have it available. Um, the thing is, well, our ops team didn't really say, well, we want to help you doing do that. Please maintain it yourself, dear developers, install it, run it. Here is a virtual machine. And after a while, the security team does an audit and says, well, there was a security incident and this build server actually has a daemon which is running as, as root. And this was an attack vector into um, the software delivery chain. Um, so not that good. And it's still a learning curve becoming ops again. Um, another thing is developers need to learn maintaining because you have different architectures to support. So like compiling a binary on, on 64 bits and 32 bits, then um, embedded on, on, on the ARM platform and different ones. Then there are different distributions, which also means different tool sets, packaging sets. Um, but also different behavior on um, dependent software libraries, because for some reason, a specific feature flag is not implemented or a specific other header is not available. And this leads into clutter. And sometimes you also have only old build tool chains available, which blocks modern design patterns in the end. So one of the questions is, I don't want to support 25 different distributions and architectures and my build jobs are really huge. Maybe we want to just support one platform for deploying our applications. Um, then 
coming from config management to infrastructure management and actually infrastructure as code, um, there is one thing like ops deploy the software. So our server admins are be becoming the ops now. We have the puppet agent, we have Ansible, we have Chef, we have Salt, we have CF Engine, many different other tools which, which ensure that the latest version or the, spe the specified version of the application is being deployed. This works really well and ops also manage different other things on the system, doing it automatically. So we don't need to use any cluster shell on thousand servers, but we have it available for the base system, for dependencies, for user management, for installing additional frameworks and dependencies. Um, we can also provision container runtimes and cluster orchestrators of containers. And last but not least, ensuring that backup backups are available and tested and also monitoring is deployed automatically inside um, the systems or for the systems um, to have to measure availability and ensure that everything is operational. Well, and after managing everything and rolling out the base system, Ops approaches dev, devs again and says, well, the application is being rolled out, but you have specified a database backend. Can you please tell us how much of the size or the estimated size will be will be uh, required? So estimated disk usage per month. Um, oh, and by the way, you wanted four CPUs. We only can give you two because we don't have that much resources available. Please ensure that the application works with your multi-threading um, resource consuming approach. Um, and then there could be the problem, for example, that the ap application is crashing behind the software load balancer and you as a developer are being tasked with, well, add high availability directly into your application, which adds another ar uh, design architecture approach or requirement for you. Um, and after all, you totally need to understand how the application is being run in operations or in production. Now, Ops approaches developers again and says, well, we want to know the monitoring requirement because we have the ping, we have availability, um, but probably um, is there a specific threshold for um, detecting whether the CPU is being used too much, um, memory is being exhausted, disk is running full. Um, and by the way, we cannot collect everything for you. Um, because the backend is running full, we cannot store all the metrics for an infinite amount of time. Um, by the way, um, it would be awesome if you could add more runtime metrics to the application, um, which means, and this is something new learned over time, also when Docker was um, was on the on the rise in Prometheus, um, adding a slash metrics add point and learning how Prometheus exporters work, for example, and adding um, the um, insights into the application. So application performance monitoring in the beginning. Um, another thing, another request from Ops to Dev, um, we have really ugly stack traces in the logs, which means Java exception, Ruby, uh, Ruby exception, Python exception, something which is multi-line and, and really hard to pass. So as a developer, I'm learning structured logging. But I also need to ensure that the previous logs are intact because users depend on it. So it's still learning, learning, learning. Now, last but not least, someone mentioned distributed tracing. Would be easier to debug the application in production and also measure the, the specific call stack and um, the application performance. So in the end, as a developer, I need to sit down um, and learn how spans and traces uh, work and what what are the definitions and how how this actually can be integrated into the application, but on the same hand side, ensuring that the application is not being slowed down by that. Um, so after all, um, someone said, well, DevOps means developers being on call. Is that a thing? Well, actually, ops might get paged anyways. Um, we need to define a DRI, the directly responsible individual for that or the team, someone being on call, um, and then ensure that, uh, that the team culture works best together and handle the incidents and everything together. So um, as a developer, I will probably will be involved in uh, being on call, um, but still as a huge team. 
Um, now that we've tackled ops and learned about packaging and maintaining, um, developers also needed to learn or need to learn containers. Um, there is a certain barrier, a certain blocker, like starting with the best practices. What are the best practices for, for creating Docker, Docker containers? Let's just maybe copy paste what's being found on the internet and hope, hope it works. Maybe just use something else. And one of the struggles I had was, I still cannot remember what the difference between add and copy is. Um, so I, I always need to look it up or I have, have a team a member telling me. Um, the other thing is Docker Compose adds learning a, a new language in YAML um, on top of that. Sometimes you probably want to look into a builder image, speeding up the overall process. Um, there is discussion on running one service versus supervisor CTL, like treating the container as a virtual machine. Um, still something not probably not recommended, but it's really hard to guess from the very beginning. And I remember my, sitting myself in front of the in front of a Docker book actually and trying to understand what it's what is best practice now. And I felt a little blocked by that. Um, right over time, it got better, of course, with more um, templates, more projects proposing the best practices. And similar, what I, what I've added on the slides here is like we similar to git ignore readme ci cd templates we also totally need to to have uh, default docker file templates for everything um and making sure that projects benefit from that and my proposal actually is that every project should have a docker file by default um, just because for a developer environment for maybe a cloud native environment with git pod and so on now when I'm learning building a, a container image, there is a Docker file, there is the Docker and Docker inception, which needs ro uh, root access. There, there is uh, the possibility to use Kenico, which implies to learn a new API for that. Um, Podman, um, at least to my knowledge, is not 100% compatible with Docker yet, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and last but not least, after building something, um, estimate the, build, uh, the disk usage and figure out how to clean the images which are there because we don't have endless disk space. The other thing is after actually building a Docker image, um, we need to find a way to distribute it. So as a developer, I learned about like, oh, I can run a local Docker registry. That's that's really nice. Um, but what's next? What's, what's coming? Um, Oh, there's cleanup, but the cleanup doesn't work, or maybe we need some some different things. Um, is there is there maybe a possibility to use um, an an on demand service or on premise or self hosted like something like Git GitLab or GitHub or Quay.io or something else, which provides the service to consume, and I don't need to maintain and run the Docker registry myself. Um, Another point to learn is what what does this Docker login actually mean? Is authorization is required? TLS um, certificates are being verified, and self-signed certificates some uh, are not cannot be verified, and this needs debugging, and this is often like I don't know where to start. So understanding this in the first place is really key um, to going further. Now after learning all the insights of the distribution, having it integrated into CI CD workflows is really valuable, um, like automating everything, container scanning, adding security on top and so on. So the whole process is just log in, build, push, and hopefully you never touch it again, only when you need to rebuild uh, the Docker image, for example, for a new release um, as a base image. Now, after having learned Docker and container images, you probably stumble upon CI CD or you did it the other way around. I'm not really sure. I don't really remember how how far I went into containers before learning CI CD or I think CI was first. Anyhow, um, we're currently getting there. So the approach to uh, CI CD is well, you add it to the project, everyone like adds 
um, CI jobs, there's lots of trial and error involved, long pipeline runtimes, optimizations are needed, and the most critical point is reviews are being blocked, so there is no fast CI CD feedback, and oftentimes you learn about the error two hours later um, because there is little resources available for that. Lots of work going on. Now, Dev oftentimes switches to ops because we are the maintainers of the CI CD pipeline and someone says, well, please fix them. And so why? Yeah, because they consume so many resources. And then you, say, you respond and say, how? Yeah, maybe read the docs or ask the community. I don't know. Hopefully someone else has written some CI pipeline efficiency documentation, um, which by the way, I did after a while having found no, no resources for our own um, CI/CD pipelines. Now, the thing is, um, and this is, um, these are just some key ident ident identifiers for bottlenecks, like the pipeline duration, of course. Um, one thing is to say, well, what is the critical path to actually like succeed in the pipeline? Is it five minutes? Is it one minute? Um, and then take into account um, you have different stages, you have, have jobs, there is sync execution, which adds a dependency, but you might be using um, asynchronous execution in the pipeline, parallel execution, or even uh, parent-child pipelines and other things. Um, then looking at failed job patterns, flaky tests, something contained with network latency, um, tests only failing at a specific time of the day, correlating to some other observability events. Um, yeah, and then also looking into all the dependencies and containers being built in the backend. So as a developer, I really need to focus and learn lots of things. Now, well, we're not finished yet. We also need to think about um, the fact that we still want to deliver and deploy the software. So we are moving from a tarball to actually, well, thinking about deploying containers. Um, one thing we need to define for the environment and becoming the ops role again is which container orchestrator to use. Should we stick with like CI CD deploying Docker Compose somewhere? Is it Docker Swarm? Should we use Kubernetes as, as a cluster uh, container orchestrator or um, is it probably not needed um, and we stick to uh, virtual machines with infrastructure as, as code somewhere in a, in a hypercloud, AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, wh whatever is available, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is container or not container cluster infrastructure and then also considering that maintenance needs to be um, added to that. So you want to run um, the application in your container. Um, you want to upgrade it and hopefully have zero downtime. Um, and if there is a security incident or a production failure, you want to provide a hotfix. Um, and this should be like happen within an hour and customers shouldn't be affected. Um, but still, you need to learn how to do it and what is best practices here. Um, now, as a developer, I need to become, or we need to become cloud packages. So again, we need to adopt the Docker image best practices, which we learned some years ago or earlier. Um, then we need to learn Kubernetes if we want to use it. So there is lots of YAML configuration involved, which can be a blocker for like getting started. Um, installing software and installing applications inside the cluster needs needs you to understand what, what are Helm charts, um, what are operators. And if you want to reuse existing uh, cloud packaging methodologies, it's a good way to look into the Herokuish Builder and Cloud Native Build Packs um, because they can, in for the supported um, languages and frameworks, they can install all the dependencies, build a Docker image and um, ensure that the application inside is being run and you don't need to care about pip install or um, gem install or bundle install or whatever is needed. Um, this happens automatically and um, removes certain things which you need to think of. So, well, could we call this auto DevOps or what, what is that? Probably we really want to just do um, we want to commit it and it's deployed to production. 
I probably don't care about creating a Docker file. I don't want to understand how a cloud native build pack works. I just want to deploy it. So no extra config, everything is detected automatically. Um, meaning to say the code, the dependencies, the images are being built and after, later on it's deployed either to Kubernetes or one of the specific hyperclouds being supported. It's a nice idea. Can, is, is that actually possible? Um, let's see. Um, in the end, I just want to deploy my web app. So I want to be cloud native at a certain point, um, but still it's 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 a challenge and cloud native in five minutes um we're not yet there yet but we'll see so in the end and just to summarize we have learned so many things that we totally want to automate everything so we want to deploy fast we want we want that the application is being built we want to have it tested we want to add tracing to it um, which is still an ongoing exercise exercise with uh, open telemetry and and integrations and making it more approachable to us to developers and um, operations teams and also sec teams um, we also want to add auto scan for specific security and compliance checks everything should be automated uh, to production like deploy on, on a friday on the weekend it doesn't doesn't matter when you deploy you want to ensure that everything works um, and at a certain point, merging things automatically. Um, still taking care of security measurements because you don't want, have, want to have any crypto miners um, using your CI CD compute resources by injecting something. Okay, now let's define the infrastructure requirements. Um, as for the application, we want to provision cloud resources, virtual machines, services, if they are available, like a database backend, Redis, clusters, and so on. Um, and for object storage, probably something S3 compatible um, being around. The cloud themselves need to provide APIs and a, and a way to um, access user management. So um, creating different roles and um, authorization layers. The application itself, and this is like an, an example for a web application, um, we want to use persistent state in the backends, so outside of the container, um, a domain or an FQDN um, would be nice um, to not having to type any IP addresses. Um, TLS certificate should be provisioned by default, um, and if needed, we want to use web servers and proxies and other uh, methodologies. The good thing is, we can step back and say, well, we're using infrastructure as code because we know how it works. We have learned it in the past and we can actually um, use new players um, in the cloud area, which means, for example, using Terraform and um, either combining it with Ansible or using something else. It doesn't it doesn't really matter on the tools. It it, it matters on how you use them, like you provision resources. But on the, on the same side, you also want to do an inventory of available resources um, and ensure that the same state is deployed all the time. Um, we could use anything of Git providers um, or Git hosting um, to store the state backend, um, like ensuring that the same state is deployed, for example, with Terraform and reuse CICD environment var variables to um, parameterize um, the builds, ensure that specific um, rollouts are being done. Okay, now coming back to auto build, um, as said, we are probably lazy, so we wanna, we don't want to learn how to build a Docker file, or we have we have something around, but that's that's a different approach. Um, we want to use auto build, which kind of means Herokoish builder or cloud native build packs or both build the container image and push it to the container registry, which we learned be before um, is used for distributing the image. Now, we also want to integrate that into CI-CD and there's a specific benefit out of that. It makes it slower, so probably not deploying in five minutes um, to Cloud Native, but we want to add quality gates. Um, so we have co code quality, 
Um, we want to have SLO quality gates and observability inside CI/CD. We have security analysis available, and we have a single source of truth um, with defining everything in a Git repository and using CI/CD. There is infrastructure as code. There are CI/CD templates available, and we can just use best practices um, out of the box and don't really need to care about all the things. Now, as with a small footprint, we also have the benefit, well, I don't care how Terraform works. Um, infrastructure as code does the magic, provisions the things, does the inventory. Um, I don't need to use a container cluster if I don't want to. It's abstracted away from me. Um, as a developer, I'm just consuming the service and saying, hey, I'm committing my code and it gets deployed and everything else. If I want to learn about this, I can um, dig into it and learn more about Terraform, CI, CD, AWS, anything else. And also can focus on maybe learning how to deploy um, with a multi-cloud approach, um, adding more redundancy and um, also failover mechanisms for some, for example. Now we thought, well, ship it. Um, and with, we at GitLab thought, can we actually do that? Like creating a five minute production app, just saying, hey, I want to include a CI CD template. I want to um, define the AWS IIM role, commit and push. Then everything gets provisioned in the cloud um, and set auto build and the deployment works. Um, spoiler, we are not there yet. Um, but we are working on that project and I would totally recommend to check it out um, and see if we can make, how we can make it easier um, to become cloud native with the hyper clouds in five minutes. That being said, we also want to, want to make sure, and I think everyone wants to make sure that we can sail everywhere. So we need to build better boats. We need to think about multi-cloud redundancy. We also want to add monitoring directly into the deployment with uh, infrastructure as code. We have automation with Terraform and Ansible. Probably we also want to take the benefit of having review apps and environments, even without a container cluster. It really depends on the usage. And CI CD with SLOs and chaos engineering is also one of the things which is a hot topic and should be kept in mind. That being said, Seeing is believing, and we want to ensure that everyone benefits from that. So Ops is using infrastructure as code and observability. Um, SEC sees security and compliance in the lifecycle. Dev has fast deployments, and everyone benefits from fast CI CD workflows. That's at least um, calling it 2.0. Um, and we totally want to go there and make sure that we all benefit from faster deployments and everything else. So thanks for your attention. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions.